Morning, folks. How are we doing? You're not doing great for the sound of things? Okay. You could go home now if you like. That's some change in the weather, isn't it? Yesterday it's beautiful, sunny. And today, it's four o'clock this morning, belted down rain. The curl floods all over the curl. And sometimes we complain about the rain. But I remember I was in Peru and I saw a guy getting up at four o'clock in the morning, working on the little furrows, moving stones to guide the dirty water down into the trenches to water the vegetables. And every two hours he used to have to come and move that because water was so scarce. And I remember when I was there, I said to God, look, I'm never going to complain about rain again. Then again, we forget, don't we? Anyway, quick one. Rattle your memories. Joni Mitchell. Anybody remember? Oh, I have one here. Good idea. Not a great taste of music, but no matter. What's the song that she had? It's probably the only song that she was famous for. Warm Pajamas Club. No, was that? Big Yellow Taxi. The name of the song. The song was basically about that you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Pave the paradise and put up a big parking lot. And basically the message or the theme of the song was that we would lose the trees and nature, all for the sake of progress in the parking lot. We would exchange the things that we need, such as the trees and nature, not just for beauty, but God has designed them to give us oxygen to live. Yet we just push them out of the way, pour in the concrete, and we exchange what we need for the things that we desire. We don't need a car park, we just we want one there. A big and massive big car park. The song says we end up by putting the trees into a museum and then charging a dollar and a half to see them. Now I know it sounds crazy, but we're in danger of doing the very same thing. And on the opposite side of that, sometimes we cling to things that realistically will only harm us. Let me give you an example. Thank you. I pull the pin out of the grenade and I give it to you and walk away. What do you do with it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get rid of it as quick as you can. You fire it until you are outside the danger zone. Right? And that's that's a normal thing to do. But it's not always what we do. Sometimes we hold on to the things that do us danger, that can harm us. And that, that scenario should be true as well in our Christian life. But as Doug said, with anything that's wrong, get rid of it. Anything that's going to trip you up, get rid of it. One thing people don't like to talk about or hear about is conviction. Conviction from God. Mm. We're going to look at a guy today, right? and his problem was not material things, but his problem was much, much deeper, and it was far more detrimental to his well being and his walk with God. The only problem was that he couldn't see it. Couldn't recognize it for what it was until God convicted him and showed him. There's a quick one. We're all sinners, yeah? Oh, at least we have one down there, yes. Okay, and there's two of us then so far. We are, we're all sinners. And what happens when we sin? Does God ignore it? No, he tries to help you. He convicts you. And when was the last time 
you were convicted of sin. But we're Christians. We're sinners. We sin. Okay. I want to start, before I start looking into the scripture today, and today is an occasion where you have an opportunity to help me. Because I'm going to ask you to read some. Okay. But before we do, again, I want to go back to Ephesians 1.17. This is not just a ritual. This is a plea to God that we need his help. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. And it says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you may know him better. Pray also that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, dominion, power, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And in that, we are pleading with God the Father that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction upon us, that he would open our hearts and enlighten us to what God wants us to do. Here's where you can help. In the book of Jonah, right? if you have a Bible, please turn there. Now, most of us know the story anyway. But what I want to do is I want to read through the book. It has four, it has four chapters. Right? What I need is I need four people that will read one chapter for me, please. Yep, whenever you will, please. Thank you. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went out to Joppa, and found a ship that was going to Tarshish. So he set sail and went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariner of the Lord prayed, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten the load. So Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, and lay down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause, whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And why do you come, where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. <coughs> made the sea in dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased thee. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then 
the name which you the Lord has given you. And offer the sacrifice to the Lord with fowls. So the Lord prepared the great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Thank you. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto, unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me around about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came into thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed, salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robes from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way, and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent, and turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord, and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Dost thou do well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, 
and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did rise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, does thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not laboured, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Thank you very much. I think it's such a blessing when we come together that people read the Word of God. And I did it for context. So we know what's going to happen because I'm picking one verse out of all that. And that's chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Hmm. What can we do without the grace of God? There is absolutely nothing that you can do without the grace of God. You can't speak. You can't see the things of nature that God has created. You can't smell the flowers. You can't hear the birds sing. You can do absolutely nothing. We are totally dependent upon the grace of God for our survival. And we all know how important it is when we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For it is grace, for it is by grace that we have been saved, through faith. And in that, it defines the origin of our salvation, is the grace of God. The method is through Jesus Christ. But the origin is the grace of God. And if we can't survive without it, let me ask a silly question. Who here would reject or even forfeit the grace of God? Okay. And before we all start categorically saying, not me, let's first look at it. Because I believe all of us, every one of us, at some stage, are in danger of forfeiting the grace of God. To some extent. And if we do, do we know what the consequences of it are? If you go back to the verse here, it says that those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Now sometimes when we talk about idols, the first thing that comes into your head is little man-made statues. They're not the only idols. They're the visible idols. And yes, we can have idols such as such as our houses, money, cars, possessions, jobs, part-times, anything we do, pastimes. They can all become idols. But the most dangerous idols are deeper hidden into our character. Our attitude our outlook, our emotions. 
because from these spring our desires for actions that are not God glorifying and therefore idols. And because of that, we can forfeit the grace of God. Now, I am not talking here about losing salvation. Because once you are saved, you are sealed with the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. I'm talking about the grace of God that we need every day. To walk uprightly before God, as Doug was saying. And the things that causes us, to, what did he say it was? The lust of the eye, our emotions, our anger, our attitude. I don't love people. I don't love somebody because they come from a different country. Is that what Christ said? Love one another. Each of these little things become idols. Anything we put before allowing the will of God to work in us becomes an idol. But taking man, it's nothing new for man to take things from God for granted. And we haven't changed. Taking it, abusing them, and losing the precious things of God. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Israelites, when they were at war, right, they were losing the battle. So they went off to get their lucky charm. Can you go and bring the ark? Bring the ark up here, then we win the battle. Now, in the ark at that time was the rod of Aaron, the man, and the two stones, the tablets that God wrote on to break them over. But on top of the ark, there were two cherubim with their wings up, and in that was the presence of God between those cherubim. And they brought it up. This was going to help them. This was their lucky charm. This, the thing of God, became an idol to them. It was to be used so they wouldn't lose the battle. And guess what? They lost. Not alone did they lose the battle. They lost the ark of God. It was taken away from them. The very presence of God was taken away from them. The grace of God was taken away from them. And typical of a man in a situation like that, what does he do? He blames God for it. And we all do it. Why did I get this? This is unfair. Jonah did the same thing. But Jonah did not have the right of accusation against God. Neither do we. He became angry. He said it in chapter 4. And God said to him in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Have you the right to become angry? Again in 9, do you have the right to be angry about the vine? Jonah would not or could not take the conviction from God that he was wrong. And you see it in verse 3. In verse 1 and 2, Jonah was called by God to go and do something for him. And in verse 3, Jonah led him. I'm not doing this. I'm off out of here. Good luck. He didn't want to do it. And from there on, verse 4, we see the consequences to, to the people around Jonah, the sailors, and then we see the conviction of Jonah himself when God convicted Jonah. Jonah said it was his fault. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. And they did. But Jonah didn't learn his lesson there. He was sitting under the vine, he was complaining, and then he blames God. He said, I'll look at it. The reason I didn't come here was because I knew you were going to do this. I knew you weren't going to do this, people. Jonah was using excuses for his disobedience and not accepting what God wanted him to do. He wouldn't take the conviction of God. He argued against it. Do you have the right to be angry? I do, he said. I do. I am angry enough to die. All he had to do was accept his conviction and confess it before the Lord. 
even today in our Christian lives, the Spirit of God will always bring conviction upon us. We are sinners. We sin every day. <laughs> you get convicted every day? Do you hear the conviction of God? That's his job. That's what the Spirit of God is here for. is to convict us. Sometimes when people get convicted, this, see, this should never be looked upon as conviction should never be looked upon as something that is to separate you from God. It's rather the opposite. God is bringing conviction to draw you nearer to him. God has not designed conviction to exclude you from his love and his forgiveness. But conviction was designed to be the catalyst for your relationship with him to grow and for you to bear more fruit for him. We have got to remember always in the court of God's conviction you are never innocent. When God convicts you of something you are guilty. Don't go around like Jonah and don't be angry and don't be given out and accusing God except the conviction of God. Because do you know why he wants to do it? Do you know why a father disciplines their child? Because they don't want the child to fall into trouble. They do it because they love them. That's what God the Father does when he brings conviction upon us. Yeah, he shows us where we're wrong. But he's telling us, listen, it's okay. All he wants us to do is to draw near to him. And he will draw near to us. And in his discipline, he's telling you he loves you. But we don't look at it that way, do we? No, because we're like Jonah. We're so proud. We keep our heads up. Instead of bowing our head before him. And saying, yes, Lord. But even in conviction... Don't ever, ever let Satan tell you that this is separating you from God. Because there is nothing on this earth or anywhere else that can separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8. Read it and digest it. It's powerful stuff. It's only powerful if you believe it. If you really, really believe it. If you allow the Holy Spirit to grab hold of you and to lead you and to bring you into conviction. But even in conviction, even in the depths of conviction, remember, and even right now, you, if you are saved by the blood of Christ, you are worthy to bear his name. Don't let Satan tell you you're not. You are. But that's only because the blood of Christ was shed for you on Calvary's cross. Accept that. You are his. Nothing can separate you from that. Nothing. You are sealed with the spirit of God. Not until the next time you get conviction. Not until the next time you sin. But until the day of redemption. If we have idols, we need to acknowledge them. And anything that comes in your way or your relationship to God, got to go. You dabble around in them, you will lose the grace of God. God won't stop you. God will let you go. He'll let you dabble in it. Until you bow the knee before him, until you accept the conviction of the Spirit of God. And if you are not getting conviction, then you need to question yourself because there is something wrong. The Spirit of God is never made redundant. Knock on holidays. He's there 24-7, watching over us. When Jesus went back to heaven, he said he was going to send us the Spirit. And as soon as you accept what Christ did on Calvary as the only means of your salvation, you will get the indwelling of the Spirit of God. 
It's not something that's here and you walk away from it. It is with you until the day that you stand before him in glory. Sometimes we forget. We forget that through Jesus, God has guaranteed us our salvation. Not just that, but also the inclusion in his selected family of the children of God. Guarantee that. John chapter 1, verse 12. Anybody remember what it says? For as many as believed upon his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. He has given you the right to be a child of God that nobody can separate you from and that you will inherit his kingdom. And that someday, someday, guys, that, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. No condemnation. Forgiven. Conviction is not to separate you from God, but to draw you closer to him. You know, God never moves. We do. When we get conviction, somehow we react by, mm -hmm. you're ashamed. We can't be going to the Holy God with this in front of us. Get rid of it. Nothing will separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We remember what God has promised us through Christ. We should all end up by Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. I have written down here that we should pray to the Lord for more conviction. Be careful what you do. Even, even up to last night, this was prepared. And yet, praise God for more conviction. He shoveled out barrel loads of it last night. And I had to just sit and acknowledge it. Pray to God for hours upon hours upon hours. My poor mother was struggling. Bedridden, can't walk, totally confused, struggling to get out of the bed. From about half past seven to four o'clock. to deal with it to be able to be compassionate towards her nothing about right and wrong and no matter how much you'd explain it she got so determined that you were wrong you were in Egypt even do what you were told. Just like Jonah, she got angry. And she pulled out. So if you are going to pray for more conviction from God, you better look out because you're going to get it. But the beautiful thing about conviction is that it brings you closer to God. It shows you that you cannot survive without his grace. That he is your strength. That in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. And conviction will bring you, if you accept it, it will bring you closer to God. And therefore, there will be more growth in our daily lives for him. 
says somewhere in the scriptures that you need to be careful about what you ask from God or the vows that you make to God because he will, he will hold you accountable for that. And if you ask him for more conviction, you're going to get it. And that would be great. That would be great for each of us individually and us totally. And it's what we need to do, I believe. If we want our relationship with God to grow, we must embrace conviction. Not run away from it. And the reason that, 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 that we can say such things as we will inherit the kingdom of God, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, that we are the children of God, that we have the right to become children of God, that we are worthy right now to bear his name. Because we are his. We are his. vision he has given us let it seep into your soul guys it will give you the strength for your daily walk it will allow you to see that you are weak and that you have fallen the Lord will show you the Lord is there I can Peter went down in the water Peter cried out and it doesn't say well the Lord thought about it for a while and so Peter went down to his knees or his stomach or his neck immediately is that what the word in there immediately Lord grabbed Peter and pulled him up. Come on. Let's walk back to the boat. And he walked across the water. And he got in the boat. And the disciple says, Surely, surely, you are the Son of God. And every time we get conviction, we should do the same. To be able to come out of it and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the pain. bringing me through this and all because of this if you have not accepted Christ as your saviour and you are trying any other way any other way by coming to church by doing good things forget about it it's only because if you did that and guess what Christ died for nothing he wasted his time getting slaughtered said I am the way the truth and the light and nobody comes to the Father except through me and this is what we're going to do now is we are going to remember what Christ did he tells us Paul gives us specific orders as to how to remember I'm sorry I shouldn't use the word orders I don't like doing that or, or using commands right? we shouldn't be commanded or forced to do anything we should do it because of the love of God for us do it in thanksgiving you know, I always say that if God's a gentleman he'll never force anything on you Except if you reject him, you're going to hell. Simple as that. There's only in this remembrance, not in what we're doing now. What was done 2,000 years ago when Christ died on the cross and God rose him from the dead to prove that he is exactly who he said he was. Paul said, for I, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he broke bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
I love what it says after this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming back. And he's coming back for his own. There are so many beautiful things in this book that tell us about the love of God for us. It's absolutely amazing. Lord, be attentive to your Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask you, Lord, for those who, who maybe don't know you or don't understand that conviction, that you would draw them to you, that they will know you, that they will rest in your, in your grace and that they will see your salvation. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless each and every person here this morning. And as they go away, Lord, we ask for your blessings on their lives and their families. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do you have any questions or anything? Just shout.